So I'm going to continue with the lecture on tensor networks. And just as a summary of what I have said so far, is that I was motivating first uh, the lecture. So why does one have to learn or should one at least be curious about tensor networks? And I said that uh, in general, many body problems are very difficult. However, if we do just a counting of the parameters, we see that the states that are involved, the operators that are involved, everything that is involved in that just spans a little part of Hilbert space. And so one motivation of tensor networks is at least for some kind of problems to try to get hold of this corner of Hilbert space. And then, first of all, you would like to understand under which conditions this description will be efficient, will work. And this will put many restrictions to the use of tensor networks. You cannot use it for everything, but you will be able to use it for whenever you know that you are in this corner of Hilbert space that is described by tensor networks. And the second thing should learn how to use tensor network. And that's this graphical language that I was mentioning. And that's the one that allows you to do, for example, numerical computations and people are doing numerical computations. And the third one is that at the end, tensor networks for translational invariant systems, so for what we are considering here, uh, uh, boils down to having a tensor that describes many body states. Just a single tensor that describes many body states. So what you would like to do, if you want to use tensor networks, is to find a dictionary that allows you from your tensor networks make statements about the many body states. Okay, so that's a little bit the philosophy. So first, you know when you can use this language in this corner of Hilbert space. We yesterday, I was argue that corresponds to uh, local Hamiltonians at finite temperature or gap Hamiltonians at zero temperature, that's roughly. And once you know that, then you use the calculus if you want to compute things and you want to make statements about those situations, then you have to find this translation. And so in this translation, I brought up several points yesterday. So one of them that is very relevant is that I'm, we're talking about states for the moment, whereas in condensed matter physics, in physics in general, you don't talk about states. You describe interactions, you describe Hamiltonians. So the first thing that you do is to make a connection between your tensors and Hamiltonians for which the corresponding state would be the ground state. That was the parent Hamiltonian. And I told you that you can construct this parent Hamiltonian, you give a tensor, and then with this tensor, you can easily, you just have to put a couple of them together, block them, find some subspace, a projection into the subspace, and then just translate it. And this will give you the parent Hamiltonian for the state that is represented, that is built out this tensor network. And now you look at the tensor, then you can say things about the Hamiltonian. So the first thing is that this tensor is what I call normal, which is generic property. Then this Hamiltonian would have a unique ground state, which will be the state. The second thing is that if it's not normal, these are like picked uh, tensors, some special tensors. They are not generic, but then the Hamiltonian cannot have the state as a unique ground state. It may have some degeneracy, and the degeneracy you can compute, and that's, that's it. And, but the degeneracy doesn't grow with the system size. The degeneracy is fixed. So it's two, it's three, it's four, independent of the system size. And I say that, for example, this occurs when this tensor, you have something like AKLT state or product state or more kind of finitely correlated states. Then you build the parent Hamiltonian and the parent Hamiltonian will have this as unique ground state. And whenever you have uh, when, when does these non-normal states appear? Whenever you have topological properties or some, something that is curious, then these are the special cases in which the ground state cannot be unique. They have to have the generacy. As you know, you have topological states, then you have to have the generacy in the parent, parent Hamiltonian. And then this was the first thing. So to connect the tensors with the, let's say, many body states through the Hamiltonian in such a way that instead of talking all the time about a set of Hamiltonians for which I have a ground state and the ground state does that, I only talk about states. And if you want to know what is the Hamiltonian, you do the construction and then you get the parent Hamiltonian. So you can translate everything that I'm saying here now to the Hamiltonians. Now, the second part that I 
that I was describing yesterday, which is very relevant, is that these tensors are your, not unique. So you can have here a single many-body state, and then you can have several tensors which provide you with the same state. So you just construct a tensor network out of this tensor, then you will have the same state. So there is some, we call it a gauge uh, condition, and that allows you to have different tensors that map to the same state. And the fundamental theorem of the uh, tensor networks tell you what is the relation between all these tensors. And basically, is that these tensors are related with each other, yes, acting on the auxiliary indices, not the physical index, not the physical spin, but these auxiliary indices which are contracted and you don't see. So there is where the, this, uh, the difference can be. Different is just multiplied by, by some x and so x minus one, and that's, that's it. And then this fundamental theorem allows you now to extract properties of the tensors that are related to the physical properties. The first is that we say, what happens if you have a global symmetry? What happens if you have your many body state, you go to the other side, and then you apply a unitary operation, which is a tensor product of unitary operations corresponding to some group, to representation of some group, and the state is invariant. Then you go to the tensor and you use the fundamental theorem and tells you that the tensor has to have certain symmetry, that you apply the unitary operation just on your tensor side, and then you have to have that there is another representation acting on the signal on the, on the auxiliary sides, which of the same group. And based on that, then you can build, I mean, you can realize that there are projective representations and things like that, and this leads to the uh, SPT phases. Then I also told you that then you can, when you have the symmetry, you can gauge, so you can introduce now, so you have a global symmetry, you go to the tensor, you identify your tensors, you identify what happens with the tensors. Now you can add additional degrees of freedom, another tensor. And now with these two tensors, then you can go to the physical system and have a gauge theory in which you have the original degrees of freedom plus extra degrees of freedom, which are at the links of your lattice. And you have then the local symmetries that you can construct. And then there are different ways of building that. And I mentioned the other day the different ways of building that. I also mentioned that this idea that whenever you plug something on the top index, there are things coming from the side allows you also to rephrase it as when you have here one operator and you apply some, something on this index, then it's moved. So applying unitary operations, you can move these kind of defects that appear only at the auxiliary indices, that you don't see them physically, they appear in the auxiliary indices. And that's another interesting property. And finally, I mentioned that what happens when you have symmetries in your tensor that don't correspond to the physical, uh, to the physical index, what happens if you have your tensor and now it's invariant and they're acting only on the auxiliary systems. And then I say that in that case, what you recover are topological phases. So you have a tensor that fulfills this property and now you build the states and the pan in Hamiltonian, then you will have a state that will correspond to some topological phase. The pan in Hamiltonian will be topological and then you can find what kind of anions all the properties are encoded in the symmetries of the tensor. So if these are group symmetries, they will be kind of uh, correspond to group fusion category of the uh, topological classification. If there are some kind of matrix product operator, they will correspond to string nets and so on. So, or uh, algebras or whatever. So then you have all the classification and that's how looking at a single tensor, then you can read off there the properties of the many, many body state. Now, there, I mean, there are limitations in what I'm saying, so this seems to be very general, but there are many limitations that I was mentioning in the way. So first of all, so this does not describe well critical systems, even though you can have power law correlations, the ones that appear are very trivial, correspond to classical models. So there are some uh, physical properties of critical systems that are not uh, well describable, at least analytical describable, with these tensor networks. Numerically, you can show that you can approximate them. So even if you have a critical system, you can just, I mean, grow your bond dimension polynomially with n, and then you will get a good description of critical properties. But if you have a tensor, and then you would like to make this translation without numerics, then you will not be able to do something, something like that. And there are other, other limitations, like if you start now talking about topological phases, and the topological phases don't correspond to what is the fixed point, that's what I will talk about today, then you will have to grow the bond dimension, and then the analytical description will be more difficult and more difficult because you have a bigger and bigger bond dimension, and, but these things I'm not discussing so much. So now what I want to do is to talk about some other topics, and topics that I consider to be relevant, and some of them are kind of trivial, uh, uh, let's say consequences of what I said so far, 
but uh, you get them for free, and so I want to talk about them. And the first one is what I describe as bulk boundary correspondence. for tensor networks. And let me just take a two-dimensional lattice. Let's imagine that we have tensor networks. So here there will be an index coming out at each of these points. This is the physical index and the other lines correspond to the contraction of the auxiliary indices. And we saw the other day that you have a tensor network and you take some region A The entropy of the reduced state in A, so you take the reduced state of A, so you trace the complement of A, and you compute the entropy. This is upper bounded by the number of particles that you have in the boundary of, of B times some constant, some log D, something like that. And so what, what does it mean in practice? So in practice, you would expect that if you take a state and you look at the entropy, since the entropy is an extensive quantity that would scale not with the number of particles at the boundary, but with the number of particles of the bulk. So it tells you now that this not doesn't happen. So it tells you somehow that the degrees of freedom, because entropy measures degrees of freedom, the degrees of freedom that you have in this region uh, are equal to the degrees of freedom that you have at the boundary. So that's what it's telling you. So the degrees of freedom, so you have as many variables as the ones that are in the boundary. So this suggests that it should be possible to find a correspondence. So you take this density operator rho, then maybe I can find another density operator sigma. This lives in the bulk, this lives in the boundary. And in such a way that if I have an observable here in the bulk, there would be another observable in the boundary in such a way that the expectation values of these observables with the state and the expectation values of these observables with the state would coincide so that the trace of rho or a would be equal to the trace of the O delta A uh, sigma delta A for all observables. Namely, that I can define a theory that leaves only in the boundary and that predicts all possible expectation values of my system. And this is what I'm saying that is suggested by this formula, and this is what you can construct explicitly with tensor networks. In fact, this condition tells you that this has to be an isometry, so the distances are conserved, so this must be an isometry. And so what I will do now is to build this isometry, which makes the map between the any, any region and its boundary. And the idea is very simple because we have now, so I mean, an isometry would be some matrix U that has a dimension uh, D times the number of particles you have in the bulk and D, sorry, D to the number of particles, sorry, it's okay. So it will go from the particles that you have in the bulk, which dimension, so this the, the number, uh, this would be a matrix that will have D, the physical dimension to the number of particles that you have in the bulk, to the particles that go, that are in the boundary, which is, yes, this bond dimension to the number of particles that you have in the bond, sorry, the dimension would be this d to the power, the number of particles that you have in the boundary. So we have to find this isometry, and that's very easy. And the way you do it is the, in the same way as I show the area law. You take the region A, you block all the tensors that are in region A, and so it means that now there will be here main indices. So you take these tensors that are here and write a single tensor now, which has only the physical indices. These are the physical indices and the auxiliary indices, which are just written here in terms of a single one. So I just write an index that corresponds to all the auxiliary indices. These are these connections here. This, the indices corresponding to this contraction. Now you write the 
complement of A, and then it will have also all the physical indices that correspond to the external world, and they are connected to the interior by these indices here. And to simplify the notation, what I will do is that I will write all these indices as a single indices that I write curvy like that. And so that's my state, that represents my state where I have put together the indices such that the description is simpler. And now let me compute the density operator. So the density operator, I, I have to trace the complement. So I have to put here the complex conjugate of this tensor. And, and then here the complex conjugate and contract this index here. These are, because I'm tracing the outside, the complement. So I connect these two, but these are disconnected. And now let me uh, unfold it and just write it like that. It's the same drawing, but I unfold it. And so that's the density operator has the bra and the ket indices, and it's just written like that. And now I use uh, polar decomposition, and the polar decomposition tells you that any matrix M, rectangular matrix M, can be written as some isometry. So if this matrix is N times M, this would be N times M, and then some positive matrix, let's say, R that is M times M. And so what I do is the polar decomposition of this matrix here. So this is now a matrix, you see, it has this index and this index. So the polar decomposition means that I can write it as some isometry. Now I have this other matrix R, which I write here. Then I have all those here, which let me call it S, and then I here have R dagger, and then here I have U dagger. And you're almost finished because you identify this with sigma, and you realize that this sigma, I mean this S is something times the joint, so it's a positive operator. You apply R R dagger, this is a positive operator. So at the end, you write that the density operator can be written as u sigma u dagger, where this u is just this part that appears in the singular, in the, in the polar decomposition. This sigma is equal to this r s r dagger. And you see that this sigma lives in the, in the, in the space of the boundaries. So these are boundary operations. So indeed this builds, uh, so, so this lives in the boundary. And this U maps the bulk to the boundary, the bulk to the boundary. And by construction is an isometry. So indeed, this gives you this isometry and therefore you can do the translation. And so you can map every observable and any density operators to the boundary and therefore do the calculations and the boundary. And this, has its own interest because, for example, in numerical calculations, you have a two-dimensional system. So what you can do is dimensional reduction. So you want to compute something in two dimensions, some expectation value of some region here. Then you can trace the rest, somehow discover what is this isometry, and build what is your density operator sigma and these observables, and therefore do the calculations at the boundary, which is one dimensional, one dimensional now system. And for one dimensional system, this would correspond to matrix product state. And with matrix product state, we know how to do the computations efficiently. So I say that I'm not going to mention here about the computational physics ideas of that, but that's based on dimensional reduction. So that's how you do it in, in practice. But anyway, so this tells you that it's very natural and very obvious to transform this law this area law into an isometry that you can build for models and that gives you this mapping between the uh, bulk and the boundary. Now, since this is an isometry, 
then you compute things like the entanglement spectrum of rho, it will be exactly the same as the entanglement spectrum of sigma. So once you have your sigma, when you have your boundary theory, your boundary density operator, you can compute the spectrum and this will give you the spectrum of the reduced state. And this is how people with tensor networks compute entanglement spectrums and, and things like that. Now, uh, okay, so that's a kind of computational tool that allows you to make this bulk boundary correspondence and has practical advantages, as I'm saying, in numerical calculations because of this dimensional reduction. Now, I mean, you can go a little bit uh, uh, beyond, and I want to mention here, and to see if there is some physical phenomena, physical effect of this bulk boundary correspondence. And so the idea is that what you can do now is to build what people call, call edge theories, which is the following. So imagine that I take a two-dimensional lattice like before, and I have these tensors in the bulk, and at each of the lattice sides, with each one index pointing out, out these peps. And now I consider this auxiliary, I leave open boundary conditions, so I, leave, I consider this, the Hilbert space also of the boundary. So this is like open boundary conditions in which now this auxiliary index that is there, I consider as corresponding like a physical index of the boundary. And imagine, so now this has like two kinds of, 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 of spins. It has the spins that are in the bulk and the spins that are in the boundary. And now I do uh, the procedure that I told you yesterday and I find the parent Hamiltonian of the tensors in the bulk. So I find, find a parent Hamiltonian H such that H psi is equal to zero. And it turns out that if you build a parent Hamiltonian, whatever you put here, so for example, you project this into zero, 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 this will be satisfied. So this will be one wave function that corresponds to putting zero, 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 that's the wave function of the bulk by putting zero, zero in the boundary. I can put zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, one. So for any value that I assign to the variables that are in the boundary, this would be a ground state. So there will be a huge degeneration of this ground state. So there will be some subspace, which is the ground space, which are all these psi alpha, where alpha are the variables that live in the boundary. Well, let me write it like that. And, okay, so this, this um, okay, that's, that's clear now because I have given open this, this indices then I have this huge degeneracy. Of course, if I would close now these indices with periodic boundary conditions, then we'll have unique ground states of its topological degeneracy and so on, but I left them open. I consider them as physical particles that live in the boundary somehow. And so now imagine that I take my Hamiltonian and I put some perturbation. And so I take H, and I, a very small perturbation of my Hamiltonian. And let's imagine that this Hamiltonian is gapped. Okay, so it's, it's a ground space with this huge degeneracy and there is a gap on top and then there is some spectrum. So I can go to first order perturbation theory. And so what I can do in first order perturbation theory is to project this Hamiltonian onto this ground space subspace of this one here because this is a small perturbation. So what I will have is a Hamiltonian, which will be just the projection into this subspace here. And so this will be some Hamiltonian, which will dictate some dynamics. And now what you can use is this bulk boundary correspondence that I told you before. And then you can write out of this Hamiltonian, some Hamiltonian for the indices that are here, okay? So I don't tell you how to do that, but that's something that is basically, it's a little bit different, but this basically apply this isometry that I told you before that goes from the bulk to the boundary. This will give you a Hamiltonian for the boundary. And if I would have this perturbation in the bulk, then I could see what happens just by writing a theory that lives in the boundary. And now this, leave, this theory that, that lives in the boundary, actually this Hamiltonian would be local or quasi local. The reason is because if you have gap, then you can show that this will be quasi-local. But what is more interesting is that now the symmetries and 
topological properties of the tensors will be reflected in the properties of this Hamiltonian. So you will have like a, a H theory you know, that is described by a Hamiltonian that acts only in the H. They will tell you how your system is evolving, what is happening in your system in the subspace. And this H theory inherits the properties of the tensor because it's constructed in this way, because this subspace is very special. It's the one that is built with this tensor networks in this particular way. And for example, you have a symmetry here, a global symmetry, then this Hamiltonian will be invariant under this symmetry. If you would have now that this is topological, then this Hamiltonian would acquire a super selection rule. So it will be working only on a subspace and you cannot get out of that subspace. And for example, you take here the Tori code and do this exercise, you put a perturbation and you do this projection, then you have a Hamiltonian that lives in the boundary and this Hamiltonian has a super, you can only live in the symmetry, in the, in the parity subspace. So, so the parity, the one that has parity, uh, even parity, okay? So that gives you a super selection rule for the boundary. So you see that that's a way also of studying systems in which at the end you have a two dimensional system, you put perturbation, then you project, and then you have a theory that lives in the boundary. I just wanted to mention that because that's uh, uh, something that is related to this bulk boundary correspondence. Okay, so my next point will be, yep. So do you think D is back from the bulk to the boundary? Is, is D to the A always, D to the A has to be greater than or equal to the big D to the curly? I mean, well, no, no, no. right, in order to have an isometry that goes this D to the power number of particles in the bulk has to be larger than the, than the boundary. The well, if it's the same, it would be a unitary operation. And if it's a, if this one is a smaller, then there would be an isometry on the other the other way around. So you could map the boundary to the bulk. Yeah. I'm saying, I guess, don't we, based on the fact that the entropy is less than or equal to the about the the equation you have there, yeah. don't we know that big D to the partial A is is less than or equal to uh, no, not necessarily. I could take just a single, a single site, a single site. This would be d to the power n, maybe two. This would be d to the power four. So this would be larger, but still this would be fulfilled. But of course, it will not make so much sense because it tells you that the entropy is smaller than four that we know because the Hilbert space doesn't have even dimensions four. Yeah. Does this follow the composition, like preserve? So if A is a PEPS, does is U also a PEPS? Sorry? In, in the poll this decomposition, if A is a PEPS center, yeah. uh, so if U also a PEPS, is it something that can be computed like Oh, what will happen is that if A is a PEPS, the sigma will be a matrix product operator that lives in the boundary. It's a matrix product operator and the bond dimension, I mean will not be constant, will be some some number. And but this, uh, I mean, will not scale too bad, so that then you can do. This is why you can do these numerical computations because then you approximate the sigma by a matrix product operator. You can compute it variationally. You have it, and then you compute yes the properties of the bulk just by going to the boundary. You wrote you add on the virtual space, right? So B right. Is, so the B is a perturbation in the bulk. You put a perturbation here. V. Yeah, so then shouldn't that be U dagger V U instead of U V U dagger? Uh, okay. So U acts on the virtual space. U has to be right to be like. Yeah. 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 Suppose you have some boundary theory with some super selection rule or have some monopoly. Is there a way to, to construct the, the ball in this case? I don't know how to do it, but maybe you can do it. I don't know how to do that. Yep. How do you see that u dagger v u is local on the boundary? Well, because you have finite correlation length. So when you go to the boundary, only things that are close because you're a gap, there's a finite correlation length that things that are close only affect them. So you go very much to the boundary, it will not affect the Hamiltonian at some position. Yeah. yeah. If the bulk is not capped, um, does a boundary Hamiltonian become non local? <laughs> what happens is exactly that. And so that's a way. Uh, of computing phase transitions, for example. So you are now you can take the parameters of your tensors, start changing them, 
then you compute the boundary Hamiltonian, and when the phase transition comes, then you will see that the, the Hamiltonian becomes long range. And not only that, if it's a topological phase transition, then you need that all of a sudden you project into the subspace, this kind of super selection rule uh, enters there and your, your, uh, well, your Hamiltonian has an infinite energy or a large energy to be in the, in the wrong space. Yep. There's some scenarios when EPS can have the bond dimension blow up. Is this bulk boundary correspondence a way around that? Um, I mean, there are many cases in which the bond dimension goes up, but uh, but what will happen is that the boundary will also go up. So the boundary dimension will also blow up. I'll always describe 1D states with MPS. Like without well, uh, unless you have infinite bond dimension. <coughs> okay, so I'll, I'll move on. And, yep. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so this works for higher dimension. You have dimensional reduction. So in principle, you have a three-dimensional system. Then you can map it expectation values to the boundary, two-dimensional, and the boundary they can mass, uh, map it to the one-dimensional and the computations in one dimension. So that's the that's the idea, right? Okay. So now I want to move to to um, renormalization group flow, which so I'm not sure if this is the the right name. Uh, renormalization group, so let me explain what I mean by that. And so probably you see that that resembles very much renormalization group transformations, but it's, a, it's, it's different. It's kind of more like a, a Kadanov a renormalization group in which you do it in real space, not in momentum space. Let's, let's see, okay. And the consequence of that is that this will be the way of going to the continuum. In fact, and to define continuous tensor networks and things like that on the one hand, and it will also give us some structure such that if we, we can work directly with the fixed points then everything becomes much, much simpler. So you want to do a theory of SPT phases or something, then just go to the fixed point and in the fixed point, everything is very simple. And then you don't have to deal with tensors and things like that. So everything becomes simpler. That's, the, that's what I want to explain. I'm going to do it in one dimension and then I'll explain why. So now is the time where I restrict to MPS. Okay, so it's one dimension. So what I'm going to say does not apply to higher dimensions. And later I'll talk about higher dimensions. And this is when you try to do that and you encounter some problem. And that's why you have to go now to path integrals or something that is different that I will just mention. Okay, so the idea is very simple. is to take now tensors and block. So we take two tensors and just do one blocking. And if I do one blocking, now I have two indices here. And now what I can do is to take this uh, polar decomposition of this block here. So I can always write this as this with some other tensor. And here I have some isometry, which I write like that. And you see, and I continue blocking. Now I take two, two of these two of these blocks and block again. And this will give me another one with another isometry here. And what I do is that I forget about the isometries. So you can define some equivalence relation that you consider two tensors to be the same if they are related by an isometry. And so what we are doing is a renormalization in the, complex, in the equivalence classes of this, of this relation, which in practice means that I forget about this isometry. And so now I have a map between one tensor, then the next tensor, then the next tensor, and the question is if I reach a fixed point. If I go to one tensor, and this is what I will call the fixed point of the renormalization group. And indeed, I mean, if you do that, then you will find that there is a fixed point. And so you can now classify all possible fixed points. And so what, uh, what happens is that now you take a fixed point. Imagine that this is the fixed point that I will give in a second. Then I can undo what I did. 
So I can put now back all the isometries that I ignored. And so I can put them here. And so it means that the original tensor network that I have, if I block now such a way that I reach something very close to the renormalization group, can be written in the form as a fixed point and then an isometry on top. Uh, this, the technical way of doing that is through the completely positive map that I gave you the other day. So remember that I say that if we have this tensor in one dimension with the physical index and the auxiliary indices, this is like a matrix. I can make out of this matrix a completely positive map. Or raw, just writing this as the cross the composition, taking as cross operator the ones of the tensors. And then what you uh, realize that if you start doing that and then by doing a uh, renormalization, maybe this automatically, this map, let's say, get rid of this isometry this is what you use that because the isometry is for zero summing into in, in the eyes goes away, does not depend on the isometry. And now just by taking two tensors and doing the exercise that I give you is like a map between the epsilon. So you take F this map, then epsilon square, then epsilon to the four. And so what you can take is the limit when n goes to infinite of this map to the power n. And then you go to the theory of completely positive maps. And then you read what happens when you take the infinite limit of something like that, the spectral, there is a spectral uh, uh, theorems and so on. You read it from there and then you get all the fixed points. And so the fixed points have a very simple form. So the first is if your tensor is normal, then the fixed points are just some entangled states in which you have now two qubits per side. So this is just a single side. And the, the left qubit is entangled to the left and the right qubit is entangled to the right. And so that's just the fixed point. So if you would put now the isometry, you would put it here. So you can interpret now the fixed point as, or the, or the tensor network as having the fixed point, which is that in each lattice size, you have two qubits. So one is entangled to the right, another one is entangled to the left. And in the next one, the one, you have one on the left and one on the right. This is entangled with the next on the right and this only with the left. And so that's the, the fixed point. And if you are not normal, then you have a direct sum structure. So you have now some state phi i. So this would be some entangled state phi i sum c i i i from i equal one to d. And now you will have a direct sum structure, meaning that you have now different phi i's and there is a direct product, meaning that they are spanned in different subspaces. So for example, this phi zero is, has the label zero one, so it's zero one, zero zero plus one one. The phi one has the labels two and three, so they are locally orthogonal. That's what it means, this direct sum. sum. So I mean, that's not so important, but when we have the classification of all the, the fixed points of this uh, trade normalization group, and uh, I want to mention now some equivalence. So I'll, I will define very briefly different concepts. One of them is that you're in a fixed point of a renormalization group, a state, an MPS in a fixed point of a renormalization group. So the first concept is fixed point of this RG flow. The second concept is zero correlation length. So this means that the connected correlation functions between any observable AE plus L is equal to zero if L is larger than one. So there are no correlations if you go to the second nearest neighbor or further. The third concept is a parent commuting Hamiltonian. So you build the parent Hamiltonian in the way that I told you, and it turns out that the parent Hamiltonian is commuting, which I defined yesterday, means that the H lambda, H lambda prime is equal to zero. It's overlapping Hamiltonians, but they commute with each other. The other one 
it's trivial is that d square is equal to e. So if you compose the map with itself, you get the same map. And the fourth one is that the area law saturates. Meaning that if I take some subsystem, I look at the entanglement, and now I take a bigger system, I look at the entanglement, I look at the bigger system, it's constant. It does not grow as I'm making systems, it has saturated. Okay, then it turns out that all these five things are equi equivalent, okay? Completely equivalent, so it's an if and only if in all directions. And so this gives you also some tools for fixed points that are related to some properties that are rather, I mean, normal. Okay, yep. No, no, because you start with something that is already uh, has power law correlation functions. And so if you do some re re RG in, in space, at the end, the correlation function will be zero, basically. So you cannot go to infinite, cannot grow. What you can do is what I will explain when I go to the, to the continuous theorem, which is just the opposite. So I will start with some tensor, and then I go back, and I'll divide it and 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 go to the continuum. That's what you can do, to go in the other direction. But anyway, so I wanted to explain something. And so here, I don't have time to be very deep, but I think that that's a very interesting, uh, an interesting uh, part of RG. And as uh, I will make, uh, it makes a connection now to RG in higher dimensions. And the idea is <coughs> to build now RG flows, but not for MPS, but for matrix product density operators, so MPDOs. And so you can say, what happens if I have a density matrix and I start blocking? And, you, and this procedure leads to some fixed point. And if you do that, then you will see that you could define a fixed point, for example, at the point where you have zero correlation length, or in which the mutual information saturates, or at which, I mean, some map becomes equal to the same. And Actually, this is very complicated because these things are not equivalent. And so, for example, you can have uh, I know, zero correlation length, but the area law has not saturated or the opposite and things like that. And so what you find is that there is yet another condition which supersedes all these things here, which I should have written, G6, condition number six, is that, so here, is that there exists some map that goes from two to one uh, tensor and another one that goes back. So this process is reversible. So there is some kind of isometry that goes and goes back. That's equivalent to the previous one. And it turns out that this definition implies all the previous ones also for uh, density matrices. So now you can take this and consider now the fixed points according to this renormalization procedure or to the definition of the fixed point. And so in practice, this means that you have now an MPDO, which has tensors like that concatenating with each other. And then you impose that there is a map T and this has to be a channel, so a quantum channel, a completely positive map, so channel, that maps into one. And then there is another one that recovers the original one. And you can say that if there exists this T, this channel T and this S such that this is fulfilled, then you can define a fixed point of renormalization group. And then you know that all the conditions above will be properly generalized, fulfilled. And so now you can take this as a starting point and do the classification of all possible MPVO fixed points, and you come to the following conclusion. That, let me call M, the fixed points. Then they have funny property. The first thing is that they can be written as a direct sum of some coefficients, mu alpha times some matrix, or some, some tens, some M alpha, 
were called fundamental tensors. That's the first thing, similar to what happens also in the case of non-injective or non-normal. Non and the second thing is that you can define now some operator O that will depend on L, that depends on the tensor that you build just by putting this M one next to each other, but in the other direction, and then contracting them. Okay, so this is what I call OLM, and you can do it even if you want from some alpha. You put one of these M alpha here. And then you can express your fixed point condition in terms of properties of these operators. And the properties of these operators, it's basically some kind of OPE condition. So what they fulfill is that there exist some matrices, X, alpha, beta, gamma, and some numbers, which are C, alpha, beta, gamma, which are the traces of these matrices, in such a way that if you multiply O L M alpha O L M beta, this is equal to some C alpha beta gamma O L M gamma. And at the same time, this mu alpha has to be equal to a kind of idempotency condition, mu beta mu gamma. Okay, so the fixed points fulfill this condition that if you build with the fixed point now arbitrary letters in this other direction and you construct operators, then they fulfill this kind of condition, this algebra condition. So they close the algebra. And these are like the Christopher symbols. And now you can recognize, some of you can recognize that those are the conditions that appear when you talk about fusion categories. And in fact, you can make a one-to-one -one correspondence between the fusion categories and these representations that you have here with these coefficients that appear. And the reason why this occurs, why by looking at matrix product density operators, we get a connection with the topological properties of two-dimensional system. So why is that? And so the reason why is because matrix product density operators, according to the bulk boundary correspondence, corresponds to the boundary of two-dimensional theories. So you look at fixed points of boundary theories, it's not surprising that you will find a classification of topological phase of, of the density operator, that you will find a classification of the phases of the bulk in two dimension. So that's why in, instead of doing the renormalization group in the two dimensions, like by putting tensors and then things happening, you can do it directly at the boundary. And if you define in this particular way, which makes sense to define it like that, then you get like the properties of two dimensions in the density operators if one dimension. I know that that's very cryptic, what I'm saying. So this should be an invitation for you to go to the paper if you're interested and to read it in detail in, because then you will understand what I mean by that. That's very cryptic, but anyway, so it's, I think it was important to mention. And you can now even classify these density operators and the density operators can be written you can write it's a sum of some projectors times some Gibbs states on some commuting Hamiltonians. And so those are the fixed points that you have where these projectors project into the topological sector and these uh, commuting Hamiltonians have some specific form. Okay, now I'm going to, I guess I'm accelerating because my time is uh, running out. And so I want to present some other concepts and uh, my goal here because it would be that you understand everything that I'm saying, but this will not be possible because I have to be very fast. My goal is just to make some statements that for some of you open up the curiosity and then you can ask me later on or you can look up in the, in the, in the paper. Okay, so this is what, this was my third day lecture. So advanced topics number three, number two. So these are maybe not so, not so relevant, but are curiosities. The first thing that I want to mention is this, what I call Ankel Hamiltonians. And that's another way of finding 
part in Hamiltonians of your tensor networks, but what will be different from the other one is that they will give rise to a different Hamiltonian than the other one. And in fact, this will have a continuum spectrum. So it will be gapless with a continuum spectrum. And, uh, and so the basic idea, of the, let me motivate it more than tell you how to do it in practice. Well, I will tell you how to do it in practice, but what is the motivation? So imagine that I take a tensor in two dimensions that would correspond to the Tori code or to some topological state. And as I mentioned yesterday, for the Tori code and for topological states that are related to group structure, then they have this property that if you apply here some u, u dagger, in the case of the Tori code would be just the x operator, x, 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 this remains invariant. This is what I explained yesterday that allows you to put now rows of X and move them and, and so on. And uh, now I build the parent Hamiltonian like I usually do, do it. I will get the Tori code, the parent Hamiltonian, Kitayev uh, parent Hamiltonian. And imagine that I perturb right Hamiltonian, then it was proven already by Hastings, Bravi, and uh, Hastings and Bravi that uh, the topological properties will survive to small perturbations. And so this means that I cannot break basically this condition with a perturbation. I will have to have topological properties. I will have to have in my tensors these, these conditions. However, what I can do is I can perturb my tensor and break this condition. So what happens now if I add some perturbation, so some other tensor here, that doesn't fulfill this condition, small as I want. And this will say, well, if I have a parent Hamiltonian, if I add a perturbation, this will give a perturbation in the parent Hamiltonian. But since this condition is not fulfilled, I will break topology. So topological state will not be stable, which will contradict the statement by Kitayev and, sorry, by, by Bravi and Hastings. And so how do you resolve this puzzle? Okay, so again, the puzzle is that if I look at the parent Hamiltonian put perturbations have been proven that it's stable. However, if I change the tensor epsilon, and I look at the parent Hamiltonian, then I would expect that this is the original one with a perturbation, but this doesn't have topological properties anymore. And the idea is that if you do that, then you will get here some Hamiltonian, parent Hamiltonian that would depend on this epsilon. And if you take epsilon to zero, you don't get the Kitayev Hamiltonian, you get another Hamiltonian. And this is the ankle. Hamiltonian is another Hamiltonian for which the Tori code, the subspace, is a unique ground state, but it's capless. Okay, so the idea is you take your state, per, your tensor, perturb the tensor, find the parent Hamiltonian, take epsilon equal to zero, is different than taking the parent Hamiltonian at zero. Okay, and this will give you a Hamiltonian that is, as I'm saying, gapless. So it can build in this way parent Hamiltonian of the Tori code, which is gapless. Now, what happens if I have not a generacy? So this happens because the, the, I could do that because I had this, this symmetry. So what happened now? You have an injective tensor, the, the AKLT state. Can I build a parent Hamiltonian for the AKLT state, which is gapless? Yes, the idea is very simple. Just take two copies of the, of the AKLT state, so just take a tensor or a matrix product state where you put two blocks. So you consider something that is non-injective because the canonical form with two blocks. Put exactly the same tensor here and here. Just put the tensor of the AKLT and now put a perturbation here, epsilon. Find the parent Hamiltonian and take the limit when epsilon goes to zero. This recipe will give you a parent Hamiltonian for the Ekelty state or for any other state that is gapless. And that's the way of building these ankle Hamiltonians, which are different Hamiltonians that have the same ground state that have very different properties. Okay, so, so um, I'm finishing Nati at quarter past, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so I'm going to talk now about unitaries, matrix product unitaries. Uh, 
that's another topic that I mentioned several times. And we'll also mention this very briefly. So as I mentioned at the beginning, you can take now unitary operators and write them also in terms of tensor networks. So these are operators that map up state into states. So the tensor network operator in one dimension will have this form. And if they are translational invariant, what I could do is to close this and put the same tensor. So now you notice that we have two indices because I can plug here a state and I get another state. So it's a map, right? So it's a, and now I can impose that this is unitary. So I have to impose that if I call this U, I have to impose that U times U dagger is equal to the identity. So how do I impose that U equal to U dagger equal to the identity to these tensors? And now there is a theory that I'll skip. And the solution is that you have to block a couple of times, so a finite number of times that depends on the bond dimension. And then you can write this tensor in this form. and can be also written in this form in terms of these rank three tensors. And this tensor that appear here, if you put them together, you have this with this, this is some unitary. And if you put the other way around, so the one that is here and the one that is here, that's another unitary operation. So at the end, everything basically boils down to a depth two circuit where you have first a layer of use and then another layers of this. And those are the all, all possible matrix product unitary operators which are translational invariants that have this form. And now if you want to look at symmetries. This is what I announced the other day. Symmetries that are non-local, then since you have all possible tensor of this form, then it's a very simple exercise because the only thing that you have to do is to apply these unitaries in this form. And you transform the global problem of looking at what is the symmetry of a many body, let's say operator on the many body state into something that is local in which you just have to consider a couple of tensors and these unitaries acting in order to impose that you have some, some symmetry. Now, this dimension here, that's a detail, may be different from this dimension here. This dimension here may be different. And so maybe this is a dimension D. This is a dimension maybe D square. This is dimension D again. And this allows you to have also shifts. You can have a unitary transformation which moves to the right, right? There's a shift. So you can have an index. There is an index theorem. And in fact, what you show is that at the end, this set of unitaries that you can create in this way is exactly equivalent to the quantum cellular automata in one dimension. Now, once you have unitary operations, matrix product unitary operations, you can define a more elaborated concept, which are quantum channels, matrix product quantum channels. So again, you can build this and impose that this acting on operators is transforming operators into operators, not states into states, but operators into operators. And that's completely positive, trace preserving, et cetera. And then you will find that there are different definitions and then there are papers about that. And it gets very interesting. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. The one DQCA are constant depths. For example, you have translation, right? The translation cannot be written in this way. Then. So All one D DQCA are constant depths unitary. For example, you can have trans translation. Just no, no, no. Translation has unit depth. Translation. No, 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 no. The translation cannot. This is why I say that the difference is that this dimension is different. So it's not only a set of unitary operations, but this output channels may have different dimensions than the input ones. So it's not a constant depth circuit, it's a constant depth circuit where you're allowed to change the dimensions in between and then you take into account the translations. Maybe I got it wrong. So you're saying that 
It's a constant depth channel, not a constant depth surface. It's, it's a constant depth surface. surface. However, I mean, let me just write it like that. However, what is different is that these intermediate dimensions that are here don't have to be the original ones. Okay, so. Okay, so now I'll go to the continuum limit. Okay, and uh, the first thing that I want to do is continuous MPS. And the idea is whether we could have states now for, let's say, field theories that live in the continuum with these constructions that we're doing with tensor networks. And the basic idea is to take the renormalization procedure that I told you before and run it backwards. So if I have a tensor, What I do is that maybe I find some other tensor. With some isometry or something in such a way that that's the same. I mean, up to an isometry. Then each of these tensors goes to another tensor. And I continue like that. And if, if, if I manage to do that, if this is possible, then at the end, I may go to the continuum limit. And in fact, this is what happens given some conditions of these tensors. And again, if you want to look at the conditions under which you can do this backwards renormalization, what you do, since you want to get rid of these local operations, these unitary operations, these isometries, you can go again to the construction of the CP maps with your tensor. So what you do is that you take the tensor AI. With the AI, you construct Epsilon rho, just by putting them as Krauss operators in this form. And then, so what you're basically doing in this language is to finding some other epsilon prime in such a way that epsilon prime square is equal to epsilon. So what you're doing is you have a completely positive map that is mapping some operators into operators in this language, and then you to run to write it as a composition of two maps. You want to apply first epsilon prime one, then epsilon prime two, and to see that this is exactly the same as the composition of the epsilon one. And then you will take one of those, and then you want to decompose it into two, and then this into another two. And that's what is called in the language of completely positive map, divis dividing channels. So what we want to do is to divide the channel, and we want to divide it infinitesimally, and it's known that if you have some conditions, this is possible. And at the end, when this is possible, then you can write this channel in terms of a Limbladian, where this Limbladian is nothing else than some is somehow like the generator of channels, which has this form. And now, you see, you have divided, so you can divide, you can divide it by any number, and so this is, the, uh, this is how you would go to the continuum. And now you can see what happens in the continuum and rephrase it in terms of tensor networks, and this is how you get the continuous matrix product states. And I give you the formula. You can show that the continuous matrix product states can be written as you have a exponential of an integral over dx. Um, this is an, in, in, in the whole uh, real line. I write it only with one bosonic component, but you can do it with bosons and fermions. Okay, looks, it looks a complicated expression, but what you have here are two matrices, 
this matrix Q and R that may depend on the position. You have translational invariant that will be independent of the position. There will be two matrices. And these are the matrices that act on the auxiliary indices. And on the physical index, you have a field theory as creation operator at the simplest case where you have bosons and a single species. And then you have a creation operator. And what you do is that you take the path order exponential of this formula, then the trace with respect to these matrices Q and R, the space of the matrices Q and R, and then you apply the operator on this omega. And this creates what you would get if you do this limit in the, in the way that I told you. So if this looks a bit weird, you can think of a Taylor expansion of that. And so you think that this will be like a propagator. You will propagate, and then you can create a particle from the vacuum and then propagate. This will be like first order. You can propagate, create particle, propagate, create another particle, propagate, and you have a linear combination of all those. And the amplitude for having a creation depends on traces of product of matrices, which are these matrices Q and R that you will have to put there. Now you can develop a full calculus with that. You can compute expectation values, you can do that. And so people have used that to look at uh, 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 lieb linear models and, and so on, continuous models. And for fermions, you can also describe them. And then you can use as a variational calculation, for example, for gross niveau models. And so you get reasonable results. And of course, so no, 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 if this is a field theory, what happened with the cutoff? So it turns out that you can see that you have translational invariant. These matrix products they provide you a natural cutoff in, 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 in K, in momentum. And so it, it's, I mean, you write it like that, then you get an automatic cut cutoff that goes like one to the K to the four, if I remember correctly. So this is why you can use them variationally because they provide you with a, a cutoff and then you don't get the divergences. Anyway, so that's a theory on its own. And this will allow you to go to the continuum limit of matrix product states and to define them for, for field theories with many, many limitations, okay? So you have uh, all the things that you have in matrix product states are inherited here. You have uh, exponential correl decaying correlations and, and so on. Now, so what about higher dimensions? And that gets much more interesting in higher dimensions. And the reason is because we can try to do the same thing. And so I take a tensor. And what I want to do is to divide it and to write some other, for example, four tensors in such a way that this gives us the same up to some isometry acting on the physical index. However, you see that this original tensor has a bond dimension here, D. And these tensors, if you do that, then it will have some bond dimension D square. And since you're only doing things up to isometries in the physical index, you will not be able to change this number. So if you want this equal to this, then there are two solutions, or three solutions, well, two solutions. Either D is equal to one, it's completely trivial, then you have product states, or D is equal to infinite. And in fact, that's what you have to do. You have to go to D equal to infinite. And now, this has been now studied by many people. That is the case of the Gaussian states in which you can do it. But the solution, or one of the solution, is just to take fields as your auxiliary indices. So now, what you will have is that your tensor, A, now will depend on the field that you put here, phi right, phi up, phi left, and phi down. And we'll have the physical index here, which will be the zero or the one, or whatever you want, the one that is creation by, created by your creation operators, but now has, in the, has indices which are fields. And so what you will have to do when you contract, you have to identify this field with the other field and integrate. And so this, if you just take the continuum, it rise to a path integral. And that's why I say, that you can define this properly in terms of path integrals. And so there are some words there. Now for Gaussian theories, then you describe things that's very trivial. And the interesting part here is that you can take now some states which are non-Gaussian and still define that properly 
using this bulk boundary correspondence, then you look at the properties in the boundary and the boundary is a one dimensional field theory. And if this one dimensional field theory is sine Gordon or something like that, then you can solve it and therefore you can solve the two dimensional problem. You can compute correlation functions with the two dimensional problems. So I think that I'm over time. So thank you for your attention. Well, you can always change your fields and parameterize with some parameters, because we will not be all of them, and this will just depend on some cut off. I see. Is the Onco Hamiltonian uh, unique for uh, given gaps? Uh, well, there are always trivial things that you can do with the Onco Hamiltonian, like apply operators. And uh, but I'm, I'm I'm not sure I don't I probably not I haven't thought about it. I mean there is a one way in which you can change the Hamiltonian because it's frustration free you can multiply by something with emission and it will be also the ground state that's that's all possible it's trivial but I don't know if there exists some trivial contraction I, I take three copies find the parent Hamiltonian and take the silo going to zero I don't know if I'll get the same Hamiltonian I don't know so does it, does the Anko Hamiltonian depend on the uh, perturbation? <laughs> Um, I don't think so. I don't think so, but I, I'm not sure. So for this last problem that you were discussing, um, would it be natural to take those d square indices and combine them with some isometry to try to reduce them to d? I mean, Evelyn, Evelyn Lee and Vidal did something like this for the case of uh, well, when you don't have the path index. But you don't go to the continuum. What you will have is like a fixed point, but not to the not not going to the continuum. Yeah, so this would be a fixed point, like the ones that you have in one dimension, but the goal here is really to go to a field theory.